In this video, we'll take a look at the standard level content from C1.2 on cell respiration. The goal of cell respiration is to produce something called ATP. That is adenosine triphosphate. It's a nucleotide and it looks something like this. So in real life, and then if I take a look at a maybe more simplified molecular view, I can see some carbon rings and things like that. So we have adenosine, that's this part here, and then one, two, three phosphate groups. So you'll see me drawing it like this um, throughout the video. So I'll draw it like this, adenosine and then triphosphate. What we're looking at here is the adenosine bit, and I'll do that maybe in blue. Blue, that's adenosine right here, and then three phosphate groups. So one, two, three, and those are coming from right here. One, two, three. So yeah, you may have noticed I've drawn it in reverse. These are molecules. They're three dimensional, so it's okay to look at them from multiple angles. So if ATP is the energy of the energy currency of the cell, that means I have to be able to get energy out of it somehow. How does that work? Well, breaking the bond between the second and third phosphate releases energy, okay? So breaking bonds, those catabolic things, um, are going to release energy. And so by doing that, I can liberate this energy that was in the bond and use it to power some kind of cellular process, okay? So now I don't have ATP anymore. I have ADP, adenosine diphosphate. I can, however, regenerate ATP. If I add that energy back in, then I can recreate that bond, okay? So it's something that I can regenerate quite easily, and ATP and ADP work kind of in a cycle. Um, ATP is really great as an energy currency. It is soluble in water, so I can have it in the cytoplasm of my cell, and it's very stable but it cannot cross membranes. And at first that might seem like a bad thing, but it's actually really quite wonderful because then I can keep it compartmentalized in the spot where I need it. And boy, do I need a lot of ATP. Cells and organisms are going to use ATP for a vast array of processes. So they need it in order to synthesize macromolecules all of those anabolic reactions where we're building things, right? Those endothermic reactions where I'm taking small things like nucleotides and making big molecules of DNA or proteins, all of that requires ATP. I'm forming bonds, it, makes, it requires energy. Things like active transport, so those protein pumps that I have to use, like the sodium potassium pump where I'm moving things against the concentration gradient, that requires ATP, and so does movement. And that doesn't matter whether you're talking about movement within a cell, like during mitosis, moving those chromosomes around, or moving an entire organism, like locomotion and using muscle contractions. All of those must use ATP as their energy currency. So what's important here is we can't just use food directly. So just like I can't use euros to go buy something in Brazil, I need to exchange that currency. Cells must do the same with ATP. All of these life processes require ATP as the energy currency. So again, to get that energy out of ATP, you can break the bond between the second and third phosphate group. And in doing that, you no longer have ATP, you have something called ADP, adenosine diphosphate, that's a D, I promise, okay? Adenosine diphosphate, and we've taken this bond and we've broken it. And you can use that energy to power cell processes. So going from this direction, that is going to liberate some energy for you to use in your cell. Okay. Now, if I want to go the other way around and I want to regenerate ATP, so I want to turn ADP back into ATP, what do I need to do? I need to form this bond again. And so that's going to require that I put energy in. Okay. So I need to have energy put into this part of the reaction in order to regenerate it. 
And that energy is going to come from a variety of places, could come from chemosynthesis or photosynthesis, or of course, what we'll focus on in this topic, cell respiration. So cell respiration, the whole goal of this process is to provide the energy in order to regenerate ATP. Now we need to be very careful about how we're using this word respiration, okay? So respiration, the way that I'm going to use this and the way you should use it is in terms of a biochemical process. So this is something that releases energy from carbon compounds to produce ATP. It is a biochemical process and it's also universal. Every living thing is going to do cell respiration in one form or another. What a lot of people get confused with is thinking that respiration means breathing. In this context, respiration does not mean breathing. If you're thinking of breathing, what you're actually thinking of is ventilation, moving that fresh air into and out of our lungs. Now, are they related? Of course. There's a go-between here with gas exchange. So cell, re cell respiration requires oxygen and it gives off carbon dioxide as a byproduct. Those gases need to be exchanged in our lungs and that's going to require fresh air to be brought in during this ventilation process. So they are related, it's just you need to be very, very careful about using this word respiration properly. It's the biochemical process, not the breathing part. Respiration is a universal process, but it's not an identical process for all organisms or under all conditions. So let's just talk about glucose as an example. And there are several different things that can happen with glucose, especially if you are a human. So if we have glucose and we want to break that down in the presence of oxygen, that is something that we call aerobic respiration, okay? So aerobic with oxygen. In humans and yeast and bacteria, lots of other things, that's going to be converted to carbon dioxide and water as byproducts, okay? and ATP, of course, all right? More on ATP later. If we do not have oxygen, okay, so no oxygen, that is what we call an anaerobic pathway, so no oxygen. What happens at this point depends on what type of organism you are. So if you are something like a yeast and you don't have oxygen, then you are going to produce carbon dioxide and an alcohol called ethanol as a byproduct. If you are a human, okay, and also some other types of bacteria, then you are going to produce something called lactate as a byproduct. Some people also call that lactic acid. They're synonymous. It's the same thing, okay? So the big difference here that we need to understand is that humans will take something like glucose and put it through a respiration pathway regardless of whether there is oxygen or not. Not. If there's oxygen, then we're going to produce carbon dioxide and water as byproducts. If there's no oxygen, then we don't produce carbon dioxide and water. We produce lactate as a byproduct in this anaerobic pathway. So let's distinguish between aerobic and anaerobic pathways just a little bit more holistically. We already know because of the meaning of those terms that aerobic means with oxygen and anaerobic means without oxygen. Because of that, we're going to be able to use different substrates as the initial source of energy for this process. So anaerobic pathways can only use carbohydrates, so something like glucose as that initial energy source. If you have oxygen, however, and you're doing an aerobic pathway, you can utilize a much wider array of molecules. Like you can start with a carbohydrate, that's fine, or a lipid or an amino acid. So we have a little bit more, a uh, little more options there. In anaerobic pathways, this is going to happen in the cytoplasm completely. You may only go to the mitochondria if you have oxygen, if you're doing the aerobic pathway. So that will start in the cytoplasm and will finish off in the mitochondria. 
aerobic pathways produce carbon dioxide and water as their byproducts, while anaerobic pathways in humans produce lactate. The big difference here, and the one that we need to maybe remember the most, is the difference in energy production. If oxygen is available, organisms will always send that respiratory substrate through the aerobic pathway because per molecule of glucose, that can produce 30 ATP, whereas an anaerobic pathway can only produce a total of two ATPs. So the aerobic pathway is much more energy efficient if that oxygen is available. So why would an organism, like let's just say humans, why would a human ever do anaerobic? Well, there may not be enough oxygen available. So we will always start out with the aerobic po um, pathway when possible, but when the oxygen runs out, or if we can't deliver it fast enough, then we will switch over to the anaerobic pathway, okay? And this anaerobic pathway is going to produce lactate. Eventually, this lactate must be broken down, okay? So we can't just have this hanging around our cells. This really limits our physical ability to keep going. It's very painful. Um, and so we must have oxygen later on in order to um, break down that lactate. So if we wanna break this down, we need to add oxygen back into this equation and this oxygen that we must um, be that we must absorb in order to break down this lactate is something called oxygen debt the amount of oxygen that you must absorb following anaerobic respiration in order to break down this lactate so again the unfortunate part is is that we've already kind of um, changed that glucose into lactate and we've only gotten to ATP. So now that we have oxygen, we're not getting any more ATP out of the lactate. It's just what we need in order to break it down. So this is a relatively inefficient pathway. Um, we're not going to use this when we can get enough oxygen delivered to our cells. So one of the reasons why this works really well is because our body doesn't like this, okay? So this is what happens during conditioning. Our body will build new capillary pathways or create new um, red blood cells in order to more efficiently deliver oxygen the next time so that we don't don't have this same thing happen again, or at least not as much. So this is the whole thought behind training and conditioning. The last main topic of this video will be discussing how we can measure factors or experiment with factors that affect the rate of cell respiration. So remember, rate is the change over time. So if I want to investigate the rate of cell respiration, I need to figure out how to measure the change in something. So the aerobic pathway looks like this, glucose and oxygen gets converted into carbon dioxide, water, ATP, and heat. So what are some things that I can easily measure? Well, I could measure the decline in oxygen concentration. Well, <laughs> oxygen concentration. So I could use an oxygen sensor and inside of a chamber, I could measure how those oxygen levels go down. I could measure the decline in glucose concentration using something like glucose testing strips. Okay, or I could use a carbon dioxide sensor or even pH really to measure this rate of increase in the carbon dioxide concentration. Water is gonna be tough to measure. ATP is going to be tough to measure. It's tempting to measure heat, but we don't really want to use heat. It's not a reliable factor to measure. Um, one of the reasons being is because temperature and things like pressure inside of a chamber are so closely related. So if we're creating um, more pressure or something like that, then that can affect the temperature in there. So I would probably stay away from choosing heat, but there are a lot of other things that you could pick to investigate that work really well here. In addition to using things like oxygen sensors or carbon dioxide sensors, a classic uh, cell respiration experiment would involve something called a respirometer. And a respirometer measures oxygen consumption. So again, we need to make sure that we understand respirometer doesn't mean breathing, 
respirometers measure oxygen consumption um, of organisms. So I would take a jar like this and I would put an organism in here. You could use something like a mouse. You could use a worm. You could I've, um, also use a germinating seed because those seeds are consuming oxygen. Um, and in the bottom here, you want to put some kind of carbon dioxide absorbent, okay? So this is gonna be something like a lime or um, potassium hydroxide, something like that that's going to absorb carbon dioxide, you want to put your organism on a wire mesh like this. And this wire mesh is going to prevent the organism from coming into contact with this carbon dioxide absorber. Most of those can be quite harmful, um, but it allows gases to be exchanged. So what's going to happen? As this organism is doing cell respiration, it is producing carbon dioxide but that carbon dioxide is getting absorbed by this absorbent down here. The other thing that it's doing simultaneously is it is consuming oxygen. Well, typically, if I was stuck in a jar, I would be consuming oxygen and giving off carbon dioxide, so there would be an equal exchange of gas volumes there, or close to it. Well, what's happening here is since we are absorbing all of the carbon dioxide, okay, and consuming oxygen, what that's doing is it's creating a vacuum in here. It's creating an area of negative pressure. So a respirometer is going to include a tube that is connected to something that has a fluid in it. And as this air is kind of sucked through the tube, it's going to pull this liquid along with it. So throughout this experiment, I would expect these levels to rise, okay? And so I can actually measure the volume of oxygen um, by, by measuring the volume of water sucked through this tube. If I want to do another trial, I just insert water from this syringe and I can get everything back to where it started. But this is the basis for how a respirometer is used. So what can I do with this thing? Well, I could investigate different organisms like a mouse versus a worm, or I could put them under different temperatures. We already know that temperature and metabolism is highly correlated in some organisms. So as it gets colder, my cell respiration rates should be going up because I'm warm blooded. A bug, an insect, not so much. I could give them different respiratory substrates. So that means I'm giving them different foods, right? So I could try to use uh, sugar, I could try to use a lipid, so on and so forth. And then when we think about what we're changing, okay, these would be my independent variables. I also want to make sure that I have controlled variables as well. So I wanna make sure that I'm controlling for things like temperature and pressure, or if I'm choosing different organisms, I also wanna make sure I'm controlling the respiratory substrate. But just um, keep your eye on how these factors are interdependent and make sure that you're accounting for all of those in your experimental design.